Next week is our second anniversary at God's house. Second anniversary, we're going to celebrate. At God's house, we just believe that when God does something awesome, you ought to celebrate. We have a party. Aren't you tired of church that don't know how to party? Aren't you tired when folk come to church and they act more like it's a funeral and not a wedding? We're the bride of Christ. We ain't the dead corpse in Christ. But we act more like we come to a funeral than a wedding. We come in here and if we dare to show a picture of, of one of our creative team members dressed as Princess Leia last night, you got half the church looking at you, staring daggers, wondering if, if this is a, a cult or not. I can't believe they're smiling. Don't they know we're in the presence of God? Man, it's crazy. Man, God is the embodiment of perfect Love, joy, and peace. And in his presence, there is no darkness at all. I don't know how to be depressed in his presence. I don't know how to be sad in his presence. I don't know how to be defeated in his presence. And if you feel any of those things, then you need to ask yourself, am I really waking up in the morning in his presence? And if you're not waking up in his presence, I suggest that you do. Because it will change your life. It's the kind of presence that will cause you to be sleeping at the bottom of a boat. And a big storm hits your waves start coming all over the place. Oh, water starts filling up your boat. It's tossed to and fro. Everybody in the boat with you is freaking out. But you still sleeping. And when they wake you up, you're like, whoa. Whoa. Why'd you wake me up from a perfectly good sleep? Don't you know who my dad is? Don't you know if he says you're getting over to the other side, then you will get over to the other side? God is restoring some snap back in his people. There was a movie years ago. I never watched it. I would have to turn in my man card if I did, Mark. But it was called How Stella Got Her Groove Back. Some of you need to get your groove back. Some of you have had your groove stolen. And God is restoring your groove. But not your confidence in yourself. Your confidence in Him. He lives in you. That's why understanding the Holy Spirit is so important. If all you think Jesus did was die for you 2,000 years ago, go back to heaven, and now you're on your own, you will live defeated. But when you understand that the only reason why Jesus left wasn't because he was done with his mission, but he left because he said, if I stay here, I'm only in one place at one time. I'm in a body. I can only be one place with one set of people. But if I go, it's better for you because my Holy Spirit, me, my spirit, the spirit that raised me from the dead will come without measure, without limitation, and he'll live inside of every single one of you. So Paul says the spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in your mortal body. Man, that should make you happy. See, I, I think like four people caught what I just said there. It's the spirit of Jesus that raised him from the dead lives in you. That means impossible is not impossible anymore. It's possible. And God wants to restore some of that confidence back. For you to believe the impossible. For you to believe in greater. For you to believe that God can reach this island. But it starts by believing he can reach you. That he can do his greatest work in you. It's so good to be home. I missed you guys so much last week. I got to, uh, I, I preached in, uh, in Oahu last week, but I miss you. You guys are home for me. You guys are my family. You're my ohana. You guys are my peeps. It's always good. It's always good when I get to sit here and see Hawaiian Brad Pitt on announcements. I got a lot, I got a lot to go today. If you notice, I brought out the whiteboard. I got into the middle of my notes last night and said, there's no way that I can just explain these concepts. I'm going to have to draw it out. So after a few months in, uh, uh, 
in hiding. Actually, this is a brand new board. Yeah. I got into the middle of the night last night and I, I texted David and I said, Haiti, hey, do we still have a whiteboard? He kind of was like, oh, that's kind of late notice, huh? I said, well, I'll go to Kmart this morning. So I, I got up this morning. I went to Kmart and I bought me a whiteboard. Because I got a lot to go through today. There's something that's been burning inside of me that I want to share with you. We've been in three weeks of Crash the Critics. We've been talking about criticism and how to deal with criticism. And I don't think it's any accident that we started off the year with a 12-week series on offense. And we're ending it with criticism. If there's one thing that holds the body of Christ back, let me tell you something. The greatest, the greatest obstacle to the body of Christ being what it's supposed to be on the earth today is not sin. It's offense. It's not sin. Jesus can whoop sin upside down, inside out, backwards and forwards, Saturday through Sunday. Through Friday, whatever. <laughs> you guys are like two days, that's it. Sunday through Saturday. He can, he, he done whoops in. The Bible says in Colossians, he nailed sin to the cross and put it out to open shame. Shame is the power of sin. As long as you have shame, sin has power over you. But what Jesus did on the cross was he didn't nail sin to the cross. Sin doesn't matter. He nailed shame to the cross. He put it to open shame. Because once he gets rid of the shame, you'll never be under the thumb of sin again. He whoops sin. But what the enemy does is he can't beat you with sin anymore. Once you have Christ in your life, you have freedom. So what he has to do is he has to trick up your mind and tell you you're not delivered from sin. He says, look at your feelings. Look at your emotions. You don't feel like you're free. So you must not be free. Even though Jesus says who the Son sets free is free. Free indeed. He tricks you up. He lies to you. He's a deceiver. He's an accuser. And the greatest thing that he does is as the accuser of the brothers, there's only one nickname he has that pertains to you as a son or daughter in Christ. It's the accuser of the brethren. He's an accuser. He will continuously accuse you. And here's the secret. Accusation only has power over you in the place in which you become offended. If you are unoffendable, accusation has no power over you. You can't control what people will say about you, will say to you. And as long as you're unoffendable, you don't get offended. It can't do anything to you. You'll just brush it off. You'll just be like... Psh, psh. Moving on. But if you get offended, he can distract you. He can stop you up. You'll start looking at your critics instead of looking at him. And we've been talking about criticism, how to deal with the critics. And today I want to flip it on its head a little bit. And I'm going to try to get through this in one day. We're going to flip it. Because I want to talk today about this offended culture that we live in. And what has been born out of it in the church and in secular society is this two-word term that is in Scripture that we throw around as our trump card whenever we're offended. And it's these two words, judge not. Don't judge me. The Bible says, don't judge. Who are you? Only God can judge me. And we're going to talk about that this morning. Because we are so ignorant as the body of Christ that we perpetuate this attitude of nobody can judge me. Nobody say, anytime anybody's got something to say to you that you don't like, you automatically pull out the trump card whether they're right or not. Don't judge me. We can't listen to nobody. We won't listen to nobody. And we wonder why the truth of God does not permeate our lives. So we're going to talk about it this morning because we cannot afford to be ignorant in today's world when it comes to this exact idea. Wherever you're ignorant, you will die. The Bible says people perish for lack of knowledge. Wherever you, ignorance reigns in your life, any area, you will experience death. 
but his truth brings life. Everybody turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 7. And I want you to stand up with me as we read the Word of God. I'm not a traditional guy. I don't talk traditional. I don't do a lot of traditional things. But I believe in our culture, we have forgotten how to honor things that are worth honoring. So whenever we read the Word of God for the first time here in God's house, we stand up. And while you're looking for Matthew chapter 7, next week, remember, we hand it out. We have in the back these awesome little cards, invitation cards. And they're little little 4 by 4 square cards. And they just say experience the movement on it. And we want you to give those out to everybody you know. Invite them to come. And, and we're doing this thing called Invite 10, Bring 3. Everybody for next week. Everybody say 10. We want you to invite 10 folk, and then I want you to say 3. I want you to commit to bring 3 of them. I mean, you might not bring 3 of them, but we're believing God. And we're not bringing them so that they can have a good church service. I'm telling you this. This is my commitment to you. You bring three folk that don't know Jesus or three folk that you see struggling in life, I will guarantee you this. I don't know what's going to happen next week, but I guarantee you this. God's presence is going to be right here, and they'll be set free. That's my promise to you. That's my money back guarantee. Everybody in Matthew chapter 7? All right, let's get up in it. If you're ready, say, oh, yeah. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Judge not. Okay, that's it. That's the whole passage. Oh, wait, there's more? Oh, I didn't realize there was more. Oh, judge not that you not be judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own? Hypocrite. Here's the issue. Hypocrisy. The issue is not judging. The issue is hypocrisy. First, remove the plank from your own eye, and then... You will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. We have a generation that likes to point fingers, but never likes to take responsibility for itself. And if we're ever going to create a culture of accountability and growth in the kingdom of God, we got to understand what the word of God really says about judging. We are all called to judge fruit. So there's an aspect there we need to learn without condemning and judging other people. You guys ready to go on this ride? Holy Spirit, open up our ears to hear you, Father. I pray that you would speak through me. I pray that I wouldn't act as, as, as my own, with my own mind, with my own words, but I would just merely be your megaphone today, God, your microphone speaking your words that bring life. Father, break the offense inside of us. Teach us how to rightly discern when you are speaking to us, your criticism in our lives, so that we can grow. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. You can have a seat. In our society today, how many of you have either heard, or how many of you have ever heard somebody say, don't judge. How many of you have said, don't judge, as it pertains to criticism directed at you? This is a buzzword that's thrown around. Everybody says it. Don't judge. Don't judge. Don't judge. It's, It's crazy. People who don't know anything about Jesus, people who don't even believe in Jesus, will quickly throw this thing out at you and say, don't judge. Or else you're going to be judged. And we say that about everything. Everything. And we have created this term in our society today called hater. And a hater is anybody that says something to you that you don't like. Now, I do believe that there are haters out there. I just think we throw out the word too easily. There are folk that are not interested in anything else but your failure. There are people in life that will speak 
to all the weaknesses in you, not out of a heart to help you, but out of a heart to hurt you. This is the brokenness of the world we live in. Through their own brokenness, their own pain, they're going to try to bring you down to make them feel better about themselves. But the true hater is not one that you can see with your two eyes. It's not one who you can touch, feel, hear, hold. The real hater is the spirit that's behind it. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Your real enemy is not the people around you who sound like they hate you. It's the spirit that is at work in them, manipulating them, trying to keep them in their own hurt, their own issues, by bringing you down. And oftentimes, the very person God has called you to deliver is the person who hates the most on your life. And our go-to to defend ourselves is judge not. And it's so good, it's so easy for it to roll off our tongue because it's the Bible. It's the Word of God. And somebody said, well, that's not what it means. Well, turn to Matthew chapter 7. What does it say? Just read the first two words. Yeah, but there's kind of, that's not what I asked. Just read the first two words. You ever hear somebody try to catch you in a trap? Lawyers do this all the time in court, right? Were you or were you not present at the crime scene on the night of October 20th, 2015. Well, yeah, but actually I wasn't there that, at that time. I was actually there early in the morning. I just went and picked up. The, that's not what I asked. Yes or no. Judge not. Don't judge. And we stop right there. And it's Jesus saying it, so that makes it even more authoritative. Jesus said that. You going to argue with Jesus? Oh, oh you saying you're better than Jesus? That's what you said? No, no, that's not what I'm saying, but, oh, you, but that's what you're saying. Judge not. God give us a generation that doesn't look at his word as a proof text to win an argument, but as the word of life inside of us that if you take the whole it will bring you freedom and usually it's not the parts of the bible you like that bring you the most freedom it's the parts you don't like that bring you the most freedom we're so good at reading all the bible passages about how god hates homosexuality we are terrible at the verses that say god is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance we're so good at pointing out that fornicators and homosexuals won't inherit the kingdom of god we're not so good in the very same sense where it says gossipers Liars. Yeah. Yeah, they don't inherit it either. I don't see nobody picketing with signs saying to create a law not allowing lying. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just saying the facts, ma'am. We're so good at picking and choosing. And we pick and choose the verses that don't point to us as the ones that we adhere to. But judge not is the popular one. Judge not, judge not. And Jesus is speaking here. He just got done in Matthew chapter 6 talking about hypocrites. You need to know the context. There's always a context. And here he starts off. And, you know, there's, there, we created chapters and, and verses when we started printing out the Bible. All the way back when. But in the original text, there weren't chapters and verses. It was just a manuscript. And it's in the context of this discussion he's having called the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus' first real coming out party for his ministry. Everybody's been hearing about him. And he takes his disciples. He sits on a mountain. 
And he's talking to them, and he gives them the constitution of the kingdom. Every kingdom, every nation has a constitution, a set of beliefs, laws, and principles that govern that kingdom or that nation. And Jesus comes on the scene, and he says, the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is here. And this kingdom rules and reigns by a set of principles and laws. And here on the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about his kingdom. And he contrasts his kingdom, his kingdom, the kingdom of God, from the kingdoms of the world. And he says, in this kingdom, blessed are the poor in spirit. In this kingdom, blessed are the meek. In this kingdom, blessed are the hungry and the thirsty. Blessed are the folk that in the world's kingdom are the lowest in society. But in God's kingdom, they're the people who God calls blessed. And then he moves on and he talks about the difference between his kingdom and the religion of Judaism. And he says, don't be like, this is my interpretation, all right? Don't be like those fools over there. Putting on their beautiful clothes, their spiritual faces. Yesterday was Halloween, but some of us wear masks every other day of the week. The mask we wear doesn't attach itself with a rubber band around our head. The one that we wear attaches itself with a rubber band around our hearts. Pointing our fingers, telling somebody else's family they shouldn't be dressing up their kids and going trick-or-treating. We're showing up to church trick-or-treating, trying to get Jesus candy with a mask on our face. Don't judge me, Chris. Judge not. And he says, don't be like them. Don't be like the hypocrites. Hypocrites, right? And then he moves on. He talks about prayer. Don't pray like that. Pray like this. Don't fast like that. Fast like this. And then he says, don't judge. I like Jesus just kind of passed judgment on those guys, right? But it's like he knows the second he speaks truth into a situation. It is human nature to want to judge it too. But Jesus is like, wait a sec, I'm Jesus. Don't judge unless you're ready to be judged too. Because the measure that you judge other people with, measure, measure is a method. When you measure something, measure my height, you are determining where that thing stacks up to a standard. If I'm measuring my height, that standard is feet and inches. I'm seeing how I stand up to a universal standard. And when he says don't judge, he says unless you're ready to be judged, watch the standard with which you're judging because the standard that you use with everybody else, that's the one that's going to be used on you. In those days, the standard was the law. You measured yourself up to the standard. And he said, if you're going to measure somebody else by the standard of the law, all 719 Levitical laws, you better be ready to be measured up to that same law. And when you're measuring yourself up to that law, why are you pointing out what's in somebody else's eye when you got something in your eye? And you know, when I was a kid, I always had this picture, right? I, I'm, I'm kind of a vision kind of guy, so I, I just see pictures, right? Uh, um, um, like I, I just, 
you know, when I read the Bible, I try to just put myself in those shoes. Kind of. And I, I, you know, he says, why are you picking out, picking out a speck, you know? And I think like, a, I used to think like a speck of sand, you know? A speck of sand in your eye. You know, when you get just something caught in your eye real small. And then he says, when you have a log in your own eye, and I'm thinking this big tree trunk. But as I got older and I started to study the word, I realized that he wasn't literally saying a speck in a log. He was talking about perspective. He said, what do you mean? For example, if I hold up my finger and I hold it up right here, how big is my finger to you? Is it large? No. It's very small, right? I want everybody to take your finger. I want you to hold it up to your eye like this. Okay, now, you're looking at my finger. How big does my finger look? How big does your finger look? Why are you looking at somebody else's issue, judging them for their issue? And we're about to talk about some Greek in a second. We're about to break down this wor word, judge. Why are you looking at somebody else's issue that is so small to you when the real issue at hand, the big one that you need to deal with, is the one right in front of your face. It's the one in you. What is Jesus doing? He's turning the tables. He's just saying, the measure that you're judging, folk, I'm just asking you a question about how you're dealing with you. And so this word, judge, This word judge, everybody see that okay? The word judge that Jesus uses right here is the word grino. Okay? Grino. Or if you're American, crino. And the word judge has a couple of definitions. But crino means to distinguish or decide mentally or judiciously to try, as in try in a court of law, to condemn or to punish, to decree. And usually when we hear the word judge, when we use the word judge, that's the definition we're using. And that's the definition he's using here. He says, do not decree, condemn any other person because the same measure to which you do it, it will be done to you. And see, a judge is only as good as the standard that he represents. The judge is only as good as the standard with which he represents. A judge in a court of law does not pass judgment in accordance to his opinion on what he thinks is right or wrong. A judge goes to law school, he's trained to sit on that bench, he does not sit with his name representing his own individual ideals. That's why when a judge, the minute he stands on that bench, they don't call him Mr. Miyaki. They call him your honor. Because he represents an ideal and a standard that is greater than him. He represents the law of the United States. Because if he stood in representation of himself, then anything that he decrees over anybody else's conduct, they could look back at him and say, but look at you, you're not perfect. If you got to punish me, they got to punish you. But he's protected because he sits under a law and he, he judges according to a standard that is greater than him. Is everybody with me? Also a judge, if you're going to be a judge in the United States judicial system, you cannot have a felony 
or, or, or a level of misdemeanor, a, a serious misdemeanor on your record ever. Because also a judge is only as good as the conduct of his life. You can't uphold a law that you're not following. And so Jesus is saying anyone who puts himself in the place of judgment, of condemnation over another person, you had better be able to put yourself up against the law that you're trying to implicate. The place of judgment that you're trying to occupy. Everybody turn to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2 verse 1 says this. And if you don't have it, you can see it on the board. Therefore, you have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge, crino, and at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning who? Yourself. Because you who pass judgment do what? The same thing. Now we know, verse 2, that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. His standard is perfect. And if you are not perfect against that standard, you lack the ability to condemn anyone else in their conduct, in accordance to God's law. And that word condemn, when he says, at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself. That word condemn, that word condemn is based off of this root word crino. To judge. It's the word katakrino. Katakrino. And katakrino means specifically not just to decree or to pass judgment on, but it means specifically to. Or to, it means to condemn or to damn. The prefix kata, anytime you see that in the Greek, kata. Kata krino. Kata means in accordance to or against. You are judged, you are condemned by the standard. We have Katakrino, according or against, you have been judged against or according to the law of God and been found wanting. And you are condemned. You are guilty. There is no recourse. But he says, when you judge, when you pass judgment, crino, someone else, if you have any sin in you, you have kata crino yourself. You judge them, you condemned you. Listen to that. You judge them, you condemned you. Well, Chris, it sounds like you're just confirming everything you said you were going to preach against or you were going to say 
We're taking it out of context, but it sounds like everything you're saying right now lines up with judge not. Don't judge. All right? I'm just building, I just wanted to build a little bit of a foundation for you of truth. The issue is not that that's wrong. The issue is that we take it out of context. We only stay here. We only take it this far. But 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12, says this. For what have I to do with judging those also who are outside, those who are non-believers? My job is not to judge, crino, condemn unbelievers. That's not my job. This is Paul talking. Do you not judge who? Those who are. Oh. 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 And that word there, do you not judge those who are inside? That word judge, just like the sins above it, is the word krino. So here Paul creates two standards. He dovetails this idea of krino, of judging. And then he creates context around it. And he says, okay, let's take this idea of judging and let's separate it into two categories. Those who are outside the body of believers and those who are inside the body of believers. And he says, we do not crino, judge those who don't know Jesus. But those who are inside, we do. <laughs> And all y'all church folk are like, what? But as always, there's a context to this. Okay, There's a context to this. Because crino means, as we said, to try, to condemn, to punish. But it also means to distinguish, to determine. To discern. And as Paul talks about this, in the next chapter, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he moves on. And he's speaking to the Corinthian church. And something you need to know about the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church in the city of Corinth was one of the most populous, rich, prosperous cities in all of the known world at the time. Corinth. It was a place of great knowledge, great wisdom but great commerce, very prosperous. And the Corinthian church was one of the most charismatic churches. It was a holy roller church. For those of you who get freaked out by holy rollers, I'm sorry to tell you. There were holy roller churches in the first century too. The church of Corinth was why they had, they had spiritual gifts popping up all over the place. And it was so much so, they were so charismatic that Paul had to come in and go, whoa, guys. It's breaking out into a crazy mob. Folk think you guys are nuts. Folk come in and never come back. It's no good being so 
free in your spiritual gifts that you're offending people who don't know Jesus, don't understand it, and they leave and never come back. So this entire book is Paul giving Crino to an entire city's church. The whole book, every chapter of it. He's pointing out stuff. He's talking about sexual immorality. He's talking about spiritual gifts. He's talking about communion. He's talking, I mean, he's talking about strife. He's talking about the resurrection of the He is correcting everything. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he says this, Dare any of you, verse 1, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteousness and not before the saints. Do you not know that the saints will judge, will crino the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? In other words, if you're going to be seated with Christ one day as he judges the world, are you telling me that God can put the ability in you to discern the greatest matters of life and death, the things of God, but you can't even discern the smallest little disagreements? Yeah, Paul was crucial. Paul is my boy. I love me some Paul. Do you not know? Every time Paul says, do you not know, you are getting told. You are getting told something. Do you not know that we shall judge angels? Some of you wake up in the morning, don't even think you can tell your three-year-old what to do. No wonder you can't believe that you can put demons in their place. You don't even believe you can put your two-year-old in his place. Do you not know the authority that's in you? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? In other words, are you, why, 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 if the Spirit of God lives inside of you, are you letting people who don't have the Spirit of God at all tell you and mediate the things between you. How come you're letting people who don't have the Spirit of God discern things in your life that the Spirit of God should be discerning in you? I say this to your shame. Is it so, this is where I want to get to, that there is not a wise man among you, not even one, who will be able to judge between his brothers? Is, it, is there not a person there who can judge between brothers? Is there not somebody in your midst who has the ability to discern the things that are keeping you from walking as his people. Now this word judge, when he says judge between his brothers, is a different word from the word judge that Jesus uses. Crino. This word that he uses This word that he uses is a word that's commonly used by Paul when he talks about judging brothers, judging inside the church, not outside. It's not the same word crino that's used for outside. Don't, don't do that. But he uses a word diacrino. Diacrino. It's a different word. But it's rooted in that same idea. Just like katakrino means you are condemned or damned, this word, diakrino, is a different word. Okay? And this word, dia, the prefix dia, in Greek means through. Okay. 
And what it means is through you, God, remember this word, has multiple meanings. God wants to discern through you. When it comes to dealing with each other in the body of Christ, God wants to use each other in the body to discern his will, discern his ways for each other, through each other. Diacrino means to separate thoroughly. To separate thoroughly. Hebrews 4, 12 says the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And it separates, it pierces into the heart of things. through, And it separates soul from spirit, bone from marrow. God uses his body to be a conduit through whom we can grow together as his body into the head, which is Christ. So here, the word of God says, for Non-believers, they don't need your judgment. Jesus and Paul says, don't do that. Non-believers, don't do that. Don't condemn. Don't judge. They need, they don't need you to tell them they're all going to hell. They need Jesus. The standard they need is him. The law wasn't sufficient to save Anyone. So don't give them this. Give them this. And he'll cleanse them from all of that. Jesus. But believers. You have been called to a higher calling. He did not save you just so you could stay on the outside, stay where you were, stay who you are. Jesus' love is twofold. It's completely twofold. He loves you exactly the way you are. But he loves you too much to keep you where you are. And to get you to where you're going... He says, don't do this. Even among the believers, don't do this. Don't condemn. Don't damn. Do that. Discern. Not condemn.
We've been talking about crushing the critics. Criticism is a dirty word in today's society. But criticism has two main definitions. The first one is the expression of disapproval of someone or something based on perceived faults or mistakes. That's the one that we don't like, right? That's what we generally think of with criticism. But there's a second definition for criticism. If you've ever done critical analysis or you put documents under criticism, it also means the analysis and judgment of the merits and faults of someone or something. Analysis. If I, as a pastor, don't take the time to analyze you and where you are in your life, to see where you can grow in him, and speak that into your life and to point that out, to help you grow, I'm not doing my job, but that is criticism. And we have come into society to see all criticism as bad as judgment against me. What does diacrino look like? I'll tell you what it looks like. How many of you have a washing machine? Okay. A washing machine is very simple. It's a container. And when you wash clothes, you got a bunch of dirty clothes, right? You put the clothes into the washing machine and the machine washes it. Except for this funny thing, the machine doesn't actually do the washing. The washing machine only facilitates the washing. But it doesn't actually do the washing. You can put a piece of clothes into the washing machine and then go, wash it and anything happen. But this is what's cool about a washing machine. A washing machine takes a bunch of dirty clothes, throws them in a washing machine, and then when you press the button, you add some detergent in, and then some water, and the washing machine starts to move the clothes around and there's this thing in the middle of it and it's called an agitator and the agitator purposely agitates the clothes and the dirty clothes rubbing up against one another they clean each other see in church too much of the time, we act like this is the washing machine and we only let the clean clothes in the washer. And we think that the way that clothes gets clean is if it's all clean clothes. Oh, I got a dirty shirt. Well, let me put it in with clean clothes and the clean clothes rubbing against the dirty cloth will wash the, the dirty one. But no, that's not how it works. You can fit as much dirty clothes as you can fit into that washer. Why? The power of cleaning the clothes is not in the clothes themselves. It's in the detergent. And as long as you got the detergent in there, you can put all the, it can be as dirty as dirty can be. And as long as you got the detergent and you got the water, you're going to have some clean clothes. Put all the dirty clothes up in there, all the soiled ones, all the stained clothes. Put it in there. It doesn't matter how dirty the clothes is. It doesn't matter how much dirty clothes there is. The detergent has the power to clean every stain. See, it doesn't matter if our church isn't perfect. It doesn't matter what you're going through in life. It doesn't matter how dirty you feel. I want all the dirty folk. I want all the people who feel like nothing, who feel broken, who feel useless, who feel stained up, used up, dried up, spit up, smoked up. 
I want to fill this place. Why? Not because I think that we're the clean clothes that we have the power. I know who the detergent is. And our detergent has all the power in the world to clean every stain, every hurt, every pain, every darkness. And my detergent isn't named Doll. It isn't named Tide. It isn't named Clorox. His name is Jesus. But the process of the detergent working its power to clean the clothes is found in the clothes agitating and rubbing up against one another. See, some of you got some folk that are rubbing up against you. They're telling you things you don't like to hear. They're pushing you to grow in ways that you don't see and you don't want to grow. And you think there must be another way. And you think that friction is bad. And you're binding the enemy. And you're saying, devil, why are you doing it? The devil is sowing strife. No, God's agitating you because he wants you to grow. That's the power of mentorship. That's the power of accountability. You want to know what diacrino is? Diacrino is a culture of accountability. You and I are accountable to one another. And just like in my house, my children are accountable to me. But even when I'm not there, if I tell them to clean their room, and one of the kids, I'm in, I'm in the kitchen, one of the kids stops cleaning the room, starts playing with their toys, guess what one of the other kids is going to say? Hey, you, what are you doing? You're supposed to be cleaning up. You're, you need to clean up. Why? And then the other kid's like, why? Step off of me. Don't judge. Step off of me. Why? You ain't the boss of me. You ain't the boss. You can't tell me what to do. You ain't mom or dad. You ain't. You can't tell me. I'm going to keep playing. And then my, my other kid's like, no, you better stop. You better clean up. You better clean up. No, I'm not going to listen to you. You're not the boss. You don't have to tell me what to do. And then they get all mad. And you know what? The other kid is like, no, you better not. Why? Because that kid understands one thing. If dad comes walking through the door, They're not trying to hurt you. They're trying to help you. Save you from you. And there's this lie that says that in the body of Christ, we can do it ourselves. Oh, I can regulate myself. No, no, no. No, we can't. Some of you find yourself in the position you find yourself because you think you can do it on your own. Some of you have 30 years of history telling you you can't do it on your own, and you're still trying to do it on your own. We are in this together. We are one body. And we are only as good as our weakest member. And I want to eliminate that idea that we have a weakest member. I want us all to be strong, walking out the freedom of God inside of us. Every single one of us walking out our destiny. And if there is a weak among us, those who are strong, we will rally around you. But you're going to have to be able to take some criticism. More people leave the body of Christ. It's already happened here. They come to experience the presence of God and all the stuff, and they all, they're all on fire. Yeah, yeah, God's moving. Yeah, I want to be a part of that. Then they get into the nitty-gritty, and then they go, oh, wait, what? The problem is not that we want change. The problem is we don't want to change. Everybody wants change. The question is, do we want to change? And if you truly want to change, you're going to have to allow some people in. And church, we got to start stop focusing our powers of judgment on the folk who just need him. They just need you to look like him. They just need you to love them audaciously and outrageously into the kingdom of God. Stop telling them how they don't measure up to your idea of religion and start showing them the love of Jesus Christ. Stop, stop acting like you're him to, to them. And start being Jesus. 
you, your brothers and sisters. I don't want anyone in this church to condemn any other person out there or in here. You don't get to do that. But I want every single one of us in here to take responsibility for each other. That's what life circles are about. Taking responsibility for each other. I want to see you grow. And let me give you a hint. Sometimes the people who love you most in life look identical to a hater. That's why it's important to know who's speaking in your life. Everybody stand up with me. At the end of Matthew chapter 1, I, I, I talked about verses 1 through 5. And I stopped with the speck and the log. And he says, hypocrite. Hypocrite. Don't be a hypocrite. Get the log out of your eye so that you can see clearly for your brother. See, even in that passage, Jesus tells you his aim is for you to help judge one another. In love, not condemnation. But verse 6 he says this. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine or pigs, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. When you work on you, this is the danger of the body of Christ. This is the power of offense. He says, get the log out of your eyes so you can see clearly. So you can discern. And you can help bring correction and growth into other believers' lives. But be careful. Because if you're easily offended, when somebody comes to you and tries to give you the wisdom of God and say, hey, this is where you need to grow. This is, this is what you need to do to get to the next level. If you're easily offended, you will turn on that person. You will trample on all the wisdom they're trying to give you. And then you will turn around and you will tear that person to pieces. You'll talk about them. Somebody comes into your life and says, this is where you need to grow. You're immature in this area. You get mad, you tell them off, you don't listen, you leave the church, and then you gossip about them to everybody you know. And Jesus warns against that. He warns his disciples against that. He says, hey, be careful. Look. Don't feel like it's your job to be Jesus' mall cop to everyone else in the church. If they're not going to listen to you, st step back. But I'm going to issue a warning. If you're that person, when you refuse accountability and refuse to submit to authority in your life, the only teacher you can ever have is pain. If you refuse godly authority in your life and refuse to submit to godly mentorship, the only teacher you will have is pain. And pain is an effective teacher, but a pain will break you down. 
and God will have to build you up. You have two teachers in life, your experience and other people's experiences. Anything anyone ever taught you, any teacher ever taught you in school, anything else in life, they taught you out of somebody else's experience. You didn't have to discover gravity for yourself. Sir Isaac Newton had an apple fall on his head. He experienced the pain of learning for you so you wouldn't have to experience it. And mentorship in your life is to help you learn the lesson you would have learned through your own experience and pain without the pain. But if you won't listen to somebody else tell you anything you don't think you can see, you open yourself up and the only teacher you will ever be able to learn from is pain. And you will be angry at that, at that process. Some of you are going through the process of learning through pain. And you're saying, why am I going through this pain? And it's because you won't listen. We got to listen. We got to listen to each other. We got to grow. Because there's an entire world out there who's waiting for us.